I believe 100% that community engagement is the way forward as we navigate this new world. And I think the more that we can think about our work as a tool, as a platform, as an opportunity, uh, then we can see limitless possibilities. Slide. So there are two quotes um, that I really uh, find inspiring. Um, oh, I'm sorry, before I get to my quotes. So this is what my, I'll be talking about in my time with you today. Um, I want to share with you um, some of my favorite quotes, talk a bit about community engagement as the way forward, um, how youth activists can also be a beacon of learning for us, and how the arts can help combat bias and injustice, a case study of community engagement evolving into social justice work at New Jersey Performing Arts Center, um, and then having the dialogues about racial injustice and some action steps that we can consider. So first slide. Um, I am a person that um, likes to have a philosophical context for the work that I do. And so, you know, this first slide kind of uh, demonstrates that, although I can't see the whole thing. Can that move over a little bit? Um, let's see, how do I, let me minimize. Okay. so. The first quote is from my mentor, uh, one of my mentors, Daisaku Ikeda. And this was written in response to um, COVID-19, you know, when it really came out along with um, the uh, murder of George Floyd. And so it was looking at, you know, how do we look at these pandemics in a way that we can advance as a civilization. So there's no other solution to the problem of racial discrimination than realizing the human revolution in each individual. In other words, an inner reformation in the depths of people's lives to transform the egoism that justifies the subjugation of others and replace it with the humanism that strives for coexistence among all people. So in the field of community engagement, I think this is one of our goals, you know, is to definitely look at how do we bring solutions to racial discrimination? How do each of us work on our own inner reformation? And then how do we then create a society, a community that strives for coexistence among all people, meaning respecting the dignity of each person's life. So along with this quote is my other favorite quote uh, by one of my favorite writers, uh, Sly. And her name, um, they have the next, yes, her name is uh, Aradati Roy. It's one of my favorite writers. And this came out also right after um, COVID-19 started to really build. She says, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. And so this, I really believe, is our opportunity for those of us who, who are we're working in the arts every single day. So we get to become pioneers of a new era. We get to redesign how we want to engage our communities and ourselves. Slide. And so I think we want to take advantage of that. You know, we want to see. So exactly, you know, what does that look like? And so. You know, one of the areas that I've been able to develop is work in uh, community engagement. And community engagement is something that is very dear to me, and it's actually been an evolution of my work in audience development. Audience development, of course, is reaching out to targeted uh, audiences, audiences, targeted communities, you know, for a transactional experience. You know, we want them to purchase tickets for a specific event. We want them to come to a specific event, and that's a metric for success. In community engagement, our metric is creating access to the arts where we want to make sure that we are letting our communities know this is for you. Try this. You know, you can experience this. Whether or not they want to purchase a ticket or come to a full on performance, that's a separate decision. But our role in community engagement is really opening the doors from our hearts, you know, with that kind of warmth and sincerity. And I believe that we're now in a really pivotal moment in history. This, this won't happen again. You know, and so here we are as artists, arts administrators, how do we ensure that our work continues to advance? And so I think back on three pivotal moments in my life 
where I was able to use that to pivot into expanding how I think about engaging audiences. Um, the first one was when I was in South Africa with the Dance Theatre of Harlem. We were on a national tour and we were asked to integrate the civic theater. And at that time, um, there were no black uh, Africans that had been allowed to come into the theater. They were only there working. And so as my tour guide showed me around the theater, um, I noticed that the workmen were putting their tools down and they were standing up, like, you know, saluting me. And I thought, wow, what's that about? And my tour guide said, you're the first person of color, the first African person, you know, um, that is able to walk in as a free person. And this was in 1993. So I, to me, that really deepened the importance and value of one, being in the room, two, uh, using the art as a way to, you know, transform, you know, racial prejudice, um, as well as, you know, to demonstrate how we are equal, you know, in every regard. The second pivotal moment was during my time at the public theater working with George Wolf, And it was right after September 11th, right after 9-11. And we had programmed, as everyone had, a series of events. And one of those was a monthly discussion um, panel that we did called Free at Three. And it was going to feature Rita Dove, who at that time was a uh, poet laureate for the United States, and other fabulous writers. And they were going to read um, some of their inspiring works. And we struggled with, should we do this? I mean, the country's in mourning. We just had two of our historic buildings blown up. What should we do? And we decided the art always pushes through. You know, the art is always going to be here no matter what. The narrative of humanity will always exist. And so we decided to have the event and we would be fine if five people came. That would have been great. But over 300 people came. You know, we had to turn people away because this was a smaller theater. But what really inspired me was the response of the people. As I looked around the room, especially when Rita Dove was reading her poetry, their eyes were closed. People's eyes were closed as if they were taking this in like a bomb. And I could actually see the words, you know, floating down their faces as if this was saying, it's going to be okay. We are going to move through this. We are still going to be our best self. So that was really inspiring to me to see, again, the power of the art. And then the third pivotal moment was when I was in Moscow. I was invited there by the um, embassy to teach the directors and theater uh, artists on um, diversity for the art. And I was giving a case study about um, how in New Jersey Performing Arts Center we had screened the film Selma for a group of youth ministers um, and making sure that they understood the civil rights movement and the legacy that happened in the 1950s. Not everything started with Beyonce and her crew. You know, there were some people before that. And so we wanted to make sure they saw this film. And I was explaining this to my group of Russian theater directors, and I was talking about the African-American history and legacy, and one of them said, why do you keep saying the word African-American? Aren't you an American? And it literally stopped me in my tracks, and I thought, what is he asking me? What do you mean am I American? Of course I'm American, but it's about identity. But more importantly, he didn't know what that meant. And neither did the rest of the 50 students. So then I learned I can't assume that everyone understands what we're talking about when we say the word community. And so the next day, they all came in, and I noticed they were very somber and quiet. And I said, what happened? And they said, we went back home and we watched the film Selma. They said, next time, start with the film Selma. So I learned, I cannot assume people understand what we're talking about. And those of us who have been out here doing community engagement, we know that, that we have to demystify on every level, not to dumb down, but to not assume. And so those have been some um, really pivotal times and uh, moments in my life. Um, I wanted to just share also that, you know, there's, this is such an important time for us in this field and becoming pioneers of the new era. And that I think it's important to surround yourself with people who inspire you, people who are thoughtful, um, that we can help use as guidelines as we move forward. And, you know, I'm fortunate because I've just completed writing my second book, um, Champions of the Arts, and so I've been able to gather voices, you know, that are inspiring, who are doing this work really effectively. Um, and one of them, you know, we talk about studying the issues and take action. So what are the issues right now that we have to focus on? Secondly, how do we teach by example? So in community engagement, we're always surrounding ourselves with community leaders and stakeholders. How are we making sure that we're advancing this work through our relations with them? And then how do we build our team? And this is where the equity, diversity, and inclusion becomes so important and we make sure the team represents the communities that we serve. And that's something we have to really fight for. 
And so, you know, back to the um, youth activists, again, I've been very inspired by watching the youth leading um, these efforts, you know, for justice, you know, today, um, of course, in the wake of Black Lives Matter. But youth have always been, you know, vocal. We're just really seeing them, them now. And I think that there are opportunities for us in our work to engage our youth more deeply and not to just put them on the side like on order slides or just re relegate them to a couple of programs, but to have their voices on it, you know, and ask them and, and then listen and then try to implement. So I think we should have youth inspired, youth led dialogue sessions, you know, as part of our gathering of information, part of how we build our community, form youth advisory councils, and we should have youth on our board of directors. I believe that's a whole nother uh, workshop, but the whole structure of board of directors, I really believe this is the time to pivot, you know, pioneers of a new era. It doesn't have to be the way it was in the past. Why can't our board of directors actually represent the people that we serve, including having young people? So understanding that currency doesn't have to always be green. The currency is the value of their knowledge, their experience, their resources. And then mentoring youth through art and residency with community engagement. So we have, you know, artists in residency where they may be polishing their craft. But if you want to work on an administrative level, how do you learn that? And so let's try to bring them into that process as well. So that's some of the ways that I think we can utilize this activism that we now see from our youth. And I believe this is what they're asking for as well. Next slide. And so the next point is, you know, how the arts can, you know, combat um, bias and injustice. And so, you know, we see so much of this, you know, in, in our society today, and I'm sure all of you have seen um, the letters of solidarity. There have been hundreds of them that are issued. And quite frankly, you know, that's been lovely. But what's most important is the action. What exactly are we doing to uncover, to unpack, to, you know, deconstruct? you know, the, the racism that exists in our society. And I believe the arts can lead the way. We don't have to hang back and wait for permission. Without the arts, I don't believe we can have a place to really preserve our humanity. So let's take the lead and let's, just, let's make sure that in every aspect of our work that we're getting the support that we need, whether it's financial, whether it's resourceful, but that we ask for it, we demand that. You know, always with respect, but with the confidence that now is our time. Pioneers of a new era, that's our motto. And so some of the ways to combat bias and injustice that we experience in our everyday work, and I'm sure you've seen the letters in response to Black Lives Matters now. I have never seen such a plethora of voices that are saying, stop this. I will no longer accept this kind of treatment any longer. We've seen it from Broadway, artists of color, we've seen it from the theater community, we've seen it from the dance community, especially modern and ballet. We've seen it, you know, in all aspects of how we do our work as artists, the visual arts community. We've seen it from individual arts organizations. And so there's now a voice, there's now a muscle that is being exercised on how we're going to reconstruct our communities so that they don't have these kind of uh, qualities that have allowed us to feel marginalized, disrespected, dehumanized. And so combating bias and injustice, anti-racism, arts education initiatives that empower children to recognize racist behavior in themselves and others and provide them with the language and social skills to address it. I believe that this has to be a part of our regular education for kids once they start school and even at home before then, but certainly by ages three, four, five. And that's not my area of specialty, so I'm not trying to pretend that I understand the field of arts education. But one thing I do know, that behavior is shaped very early on. And if we can start to realize that that's the point that we need to talk to our children about the words that we say, how do we respond to things we see on television? I remember my daughter was six or seven years old, and she was watching one of the Disney programs, and she said, Mom, I want to be white. And I said, oh, really? Why would be, why you want to be white, honey? In the meantime, I'm like, oh, hell no. But she said, you know, the reason I want to be white is because they're smart. When I'm watching these TV programs, they're the ones who get ahead. They're the ones who have the nice houses. So that was an image that she thought watching that. And so, you know, can you imagine, so if you're a white child, then what do you take away from that as well? 
And so this is where we have to really focus our work. So those of us doing arts education, this component needs to be integrated in their learning as well. Also, to fund new productions of works by Black, Indigenous people of color that leverage the arts to address history and racial injustice. So this can provide opportunities for learning, growth, and healing. And so, yes, you know, we know that there are many arts organizations that pretty much stay with the same um, kinds of work and same artists. But what we're suggesting is to open this up to new voices, to younger voices that talk about history, that talk about what's going on today from an uh, artistic perspective so that we can learn that, you know, as we're growing and developing. Our civic organizations, you know, should partner with the arts as a platform to demonstrate and promote the vision of what building a just and equitable society looks like. And so we don't have to do this in a vacuum. So this means that we partner with our local civic uh, cultural organizations. So that means that we work with our chamber of commerce. We work with our arts councils. You know, all of these entities that have people, that have resources, so that we can together start to really create the kind of society that we all dream of. And then lastly, you know, civil rights organizations, you know, um, that should be supporting the performances and workshops uh, to translate into social justice initiatives. And so I think that we have unlimited possibilities with this, you know, so I know that right after, um, you know, George Floyd was murdered, there were millions of dollars being given to many of our civil rights organizations. How fantastic is that? Why not have the arts to make sure they're in the conversation of how we can help you to translate this vision, this goal? These, we, these are events that we're already building, that we're thinking about, and perhaps partnering together you know, to make this a reality. So we have new op opportunities for partnerships that perhaps didn't exist before. And I'm encouraging us as art makers, you know, art curators, to advance you know, with that kind of bold confidence that what we're doing is exactly what pioneers of the new era should be doing. Um, and then I wanted to share a case study. You know, um, New Jersey Performing Arts Center, where I've had the privilege of working at for several years. Um, have the next slide. And so at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, you know, we, uh, we're now, what, 23 years old, I believe. And so always at the beginning of New Jersey Performing Arts Center, there was a solid foundation for audience development. It was constructed with that, you know, based in Newark, New Jersey, always looking at the legacy of African-American culture and history and making sure those voices and their participation was integrated into the construction of the building as well as the execution of the work. Um, and then when I came um, in 2012 as a vice president of marketing, you know, of course I was bringing my skills in audience development. But one thing I noticed was as a VP marketing and anyone here who's that knows that you don't have a lot of time for community engagement. You know, we have sales goals and you better make those sales goals. And so uh, after dialogue, you know, with our president, John Schreiber, he agreed that we would create a community engagement department. And at that time, uh, 2015, we were one of the few performing arts centers in the country that was able to have a vice president of community engagement with a dedicated budget with a team to look at how do we create access to the arts? How do we respond to the needs and interests of our changing demographics? What does that look like? And we built you know, significant programs to do over 200 events per year, um, serving close to 30,000 people just through community engagement. And then Black Lives Matter really emerged, you know, because of the murder of George Floyd. And so we then pivoted our efforts. So in addition to what we've already doing, we created a new initiative called our Social Justice Task Force. And with that, we created on our website, Standing in Solidarity. And so for us, it wasn't enough to say, to write a letter that says, we stand with you. Okay, that, like I said, that's cute. But you have to take the Band-Aid off. So we did that. And we said, okay, what can we do to help change the dynamics of our community? What can we focus on? What are the action steps we need to look at? And so we created programs and events that reflect social justice issues and solutions. And we did this in less than a month. And so already we've had two events. And what our structure is, is that we will have a panel discussion on a, a, a topic, and then we have a film screening where we can then unpack those topics based on the film. So last Monday, we um, had the film screening of the uh, Alba DuVernay's film 13th, 
about the penal system and, and racism in the prison system. And then we had a panel discussion to really look at that from, from people who work in the system to uh, a young woman whose both of her parents had been incarcerated, you know, to um, academics who are looking at it from that perspective of how this changes the scope and engagement of young people. And so what is the upshot of this? The upshot is to vote. And so our focus right now is a social um, justice initiative is to register as many of our citizens in the greater Newark area to vote. And then to register, I'm sorry, to register to vote and then to vote. We're also equally focused on completing the census because those are the two power bases that we have. And so community engagement, you know, in addition to creating access to the arts, we have to look at what's the issue in front of us. And right now, the issue is social justice. The issue is uprooting racism. So that we can enjoy the arts and see that this all is connected. Um, and so that has really been um, quite an exciting experience. In addition to the programs that we're doing, and next month we'll be um, featuring programs on white allyship and looking at what that means and how white individuals who want to support can be a partner, can be an ally, can be a co-conspirator. How does that shape? You know, what does that look like? So that'll be on panel next month. And we're programming through next June at the minimum, because as you know, this doesn't go away. This takes a lifetime for transformation, but we're at the beginning, pioneers of a new era. Um, also on our Standing in Solidarity page, we have um, a resource page that we're constantly updating. So we serve as a source of information. You know, we are teaching and educating our um, constituents about where they can go uh, to read more, to watch more movies, uh, to have more discussion, things they can do with their family. Um, so that really serving the community. And so the genesis of community engagement still is framing, you know, their, their experience with the art center. But I believe that our art centers can be more than just, uh, you know, having the performances or maybe more than just giving classes, but actually uh, to, to educate and inspire and provide the tools so that each of us feels as if we can be a pioneer of a new era. We don't have to wait for someone to do that for us. I think the role of the arts uh, can be much broader and has to be much more broader at this time. And so it's really interesting to see how you know, in the, in the 80s and 90s, you know, artist development was such a big deal. You know, it was so incredible, you know, that we're going to look at these targeted groups, which were pr primarily ethnic specific, you know, younger generation, LGBTQ. You know, we're going to look at how can we make sure they feel equally, you know, embraced as audience members. Great. Now we're, you know, then involved into more of the community engagement to make it more expansive, to make it more based on accessibility, and to look at how artists you know, and the art itself, you know, needs to be on an equitable level. And then now to the social justice because of, you know, frankly, the opportunity that so many millions of people had to actually witness a murder. You know, what's one thing we read about in the paper, we heard about it, but to witness that, I think, is really the tipping point. It certainly was for me. Uh, and so at this point, you know, I can't imagine my work not uh, being primarily looking at how do we help transform these organizations? So the last point I want to make is that the social justice work, you know, community engagement work, I don't believe can be successful and effective without making sure there is a culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the organizations themselves. And so that means that how are we making sure that the individuals are also adhering to this inner reformation that we each of us are looking at what does diversity look like so sometimes people will say oh we have diversity and they're talking about their front of house staff or they're talking about the cleaning staff that's not what we're talking about so when we talk about diversity we're talking about at all levels of administration you know including the board and so that's where the work really has to happen we talk about equity which is what gary is going to take a deep dive into really looking at the definition of equity and then how does that exist you know within our arts world and certainly an inclusion and making sure the voices of the very people we serve are being represented on all the levels of decision making from how we hire people to who are the vendors that we utilize you know to of course the uh, not just the artists that we book 
but how do we even market them? You know, and what do we say about them? What is the language that we use? So yes, you're probably exhausted just thinking about all of it, but this is the kind of work that I believe will then build sustainable art organizations for the next 100 years. Right now, we don't have the luxury of going into our buildings and our offices, our centers, organizations, and making our work. And so we're now developing a new way of building our work. Much of it right now is virtual. And so how this will translate more into the human relationships and the connection, I believe, is rooted in how deeply we can connect to building this culture diversity, to looking at how community engagement and expands into social justice work. You know, this is the moment. This is our pivotal moment. Let's not miss it. You know, let's really decide, let's make up our minds that, you know, we are going to create a new way that the arts are experienced, that they're presented, that we narrate them, you know, in this country in particular, and then of course globally because we have access, you know, through our, our computers. But how important this is for us. And I'm just so happy that you all are here today so that we can share in this kind of thinking, each person from your own unique perspective, each of you is a jewel that has the ability to craft a new narrative. And I'm encouraging you to take a step forward. You know, of course, we don't have all the answers and you probably don't have any money. But when has that ever stopped us? Who has the money that we really need uh, to build the initiatives that we want? But somehow we make that happen. So let's advance together uh, with this you know, kind of uh, effort and enthusiasm and passion that I know each of you brings to your work. And now we're going to hear from uh, Gary, who's really going to talk about the equity component, because that's the one that I think we can go in more deeply and to see even greater results. So thank you very much. Oh, Donna, you are an OG. Thank you for what you <laughs> shared. <laughs> I appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, that was amazing. Um, so as Donna shared, um, you know, my, um, you know, my, my portion of this presentation, next slide, please, will be um, centered around equity and, um, and, and sort of looking at what, what it means, like how, how do we define it, define it um, you know, uh, where we are and sort of understanding, you know, this uh, um, sort of concept and, and how do we achieve it? How do we accomplish it within our own space as individuals, within our communities? within our institutions, et cetera. And I want to preface all of this by saying that, you know, while I am employed and I do, you know, um, work for the New York Philharmonic, I'm, I'm coming here um, speaking on, uh, as an individual, as a person, as a black man, as a person of color. Um, and I feel like it's important for me to share that because I, you know, quite often we, we assign ourselves institutions, um, but I think this particular work is, 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 is my work. And so, um, if you hear anything that you don't agree with, do not blame the Philharmonic, um, and, and don't blame me. I might be sleep deprived, but but certainly we can um, we can get into these conversations in a very meaningful way. And I'm hoping uh, to be able to learn from you as much as as uh, you know we can learn from each other through this process. And so, um, just to start with, I want to next slide, please. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna sort of do an exercise. And shout out to my my homie um, Toya Lillard who runs Vibe Theater Experience for putting me onto this. And um, and so I, I want to, to invite the group, if you can sort of minimize, we talk about minimizing. This will be the only time today, I promise, where you have to go on Zoom and go on your web browser. Web browser. And so if you wouldn't mind um, uh, going to www.menti.com, so www.menti.com, and use the code uh, 954069. And I want to see and understand from this particular group, we have 278 participants. Um, what words or phrases come to mind for you when you hear uh, the term equity? Um, so we'll give you about two minutes, two to three minutes to just uh, populate. And, and I'm gonna, um, we're gonna exit this screen and I'm gonna share my screen so that we could um, sort of see where, where this all lands. And so as, as we notice, as you guys are putting this in, um, the words that are common will, will start to get larger and the words that are um, sort of, you know, not as common will get smaller. So fair was definitely a, um, 
a big word in this, equal, fairness, justice. So Gary, just to describe what's happening, what we're experiencing right now, right? It's yes. sort of like a web of words on our screen and multi, multiple colors that are popping up. Um, some words smaller than others, like you mentioned. Thanks for that, Hector. Opportunity seems to be a word that's getting... We're going to give ourselves 30 more seconds. Justice is definitely um, at the forefront. Equal community access. Okay, and you, you all can continue can continue to add to this, um, and and so I think you know this this will just just to understand where we are as a community, how we're defining it. I think you know it's it's critical that w as we come into these spaces, that we have an understanding of what what this all means. I see reparations is also here. Um, Hector and Donna, are any words jump out to you as you are looking at this? Uh, necessary. Necessary. Representation. Okay. Um, so we can go back to the Respect. slide. What was that? Respect? Yes. Respect? Yes. Even playing field, opportunity. Um, so while you guys are continuing, and, and we can come back and share this, actually, we can send this out to the participants later on so you'll see the words that are being populated. Um, but, but if we can go back to the slide and, and continue from here, that'd be great. Thank you. And so, so we're moving. Um, we're moving into certain definitions of, of, of the word equity. And so I just wanted to pull out some examples here that um, I found, you know, uh, on the web that I wanted to share. One is the Ford Foundation, where it says equity seeks to ensure fair treatment, equality of opportunity and fairness and access to information and resources for all. We believe this is only possible in an environment built on respect and dignity. So just, you know, obviously it's pretty self-explanatory there. I, I'm also pulling out one from the independent sector um, uh, where they talk about equity being um, at the same time striving to identify and eliminate barriers that have prevented the full participation of some groups. So we, we noticed the, the idea of, of um, you know, equity, including fair treatment, equality is certainly a part of it, um, fairness, et cetera. Um, but there's also an active portion of that. You know, it's not only the, the idea of recognizing it, but it's but it's the the notion that it, in order for us to achieve equity, um, there's there's a there's a need for us to dismantle the systems of inequity that exist within our field, within our communities, et cetera. And um, and then the last uh, portion is just my own, and please do not quote me on this. Um, uh, it's essentially full access to power in a way that helps shape your world as we know it. And so what would it look like if, if you as an individual had the power to ensure that, that your community, your space was fully equitable, that it, it looked the way you want it to look like? And of course, we're not, I'm not uh, advocating that one person control all the power, but if, if you had equal, an equal stake in, in what your community looked like, um, I think um, you know, it, it would be a very different world for us. And I, you know, I'm having a hard time at full transparency envisioning that world but it's something that we need to strive towards. Um, next slide, please. And so to affirm that, that, that notion, I, I brought in a quote um, from one of our ancestors, Kwame Ture, AKA Sokli Carmichael, who said the first need of a free people is to define their own terms. So, you know, for us uh, as a people who um, have been liberated or are still going through this process of liberation, um, as, as, as Carmichael pointed out, um, the, first, the first need is to define what, what, you know, what we want to do and, and how we want to do it. And so I think for us in the space of the arts, um, you know, quite often we, we sort of create the terms and we allow you to come into the space to participate in our, in our terms. And, and what, what 
Carmichael and what and what equity should look like is um, is is um, is that you have the ability, especially for, for folks who have been marginalized, for Black people, for people of color, um, that you have the ability to really shape what that world looks like um, for yourselves. Uh, next next slide, please. And so, again, just to kind of to unpack this, you know, equity and is is a space that is that is active. So, um, if folks are saying we we believe in equity, then you need to look at the actions. What are your actions? But beyond your statement, and to to sort of um, piggyback to what what Donna was sharing, also equity is an intentional process. It's an intentional action. So if you if you believe that this work is truly um, important or critical to your organization or to you as an individual. What time, what investment, what resources are you allocating to ensure that that actual work takes place within your organization? Um, it'll require folks to step aside when necessary. So especially for, um, for folks who are individuals who um, are in places of privilege, it, it, it means that you are ensuring that you are stepping aside to, to, um, to create space or to allow for other folks to be able to step in. And that, also, that notion also goes for institutions that take um, and take up a lot of space. You know, we take up a lot of, you know, for, for especially white-led institutions where, where, they're, where we can certainly, um, we have a platform, but are we using our platform to, um, to, to, you know, in a way that actually allows other folks to stay in? Or are we taking up so much space that we can't see, um, you know, who the other institutions or who the other organizations are that are also a part of this work? And so one example of that, and it's, this is not a critique, um, to, well, I guess it is a critique, but, but, um, but for, for organizations or folks that have not, now sort of co-opted the Black Lives Matter slogan, I mean, while it is great that we all feel the importance to, of, of, of acknowledging black people and, and not acknowledging um, uh, communities that have been historically marginalized, now that sort of brand has been co-opted by mostly white-led organizations. And so what does that mean? How do we move away from that in a way that other organizations that have actually been doing the work for decades um, can actually um, take their equal um, uh, place in, in this world. Um, and also, it doesn't feel good. It may not feel good for those who are, who are used to all the power. So if, you know, in order for you to really um, begin to get into this work of equity, it means that, you know, if you're sacrificing, it's not going to feel good to sacrifice. And so um, what does that look like for you? I, I can't necessarily dictate or determine, but, but, to, um, but, if, but, it, but, it, but it isn't a feeling of... of, of uh, gratitude or, or, you know, I mean, it's, it's just not going to be a, a great feeling. And also it puts the right people in the decision-making process. And so to Donna's point, as we think about diversity, you know, or, or you know, reflection or inclusivity, um, who are the people that are at the table? And so if you are in an organization where all the white people are the ones that are making the decisions for everyone else, then clearly the right people are not at the, at the table <laughs> in making those decisions. And so Ensuring that, that and it, it goes for race, it goes for ability, it goes for gender, et cetera. I mean, this is not limited to race, while race is certainly important in this conversation as well. But I want to also acknowledge that this is something that, that crosses um, communities and, 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 and groups of folks that, that, um, that have been, you know, uh, historically marginalized. But equity is not a passive process, as I pointed out. It is not diversity. And so the one thing I want to just call out, um, and, and as you all know, I am not a diverse person. I am a black man. And so as we think about this work, quite often folks will, you know, as you know, we start to think about it, it's through the lens of, of whiteness. And so anyone who's other is diverse, who, who's, who's not representative of the sort of dominant population. And so when we think about diversity, it is the full representation of folks that should be at the table. And so um, that's, I want to note that as well. And it's, it is not temporary. And so... And, in actuality, um, equity, um, to, in my opinion, leads to the sustainability of diversity and inclusion. And so, if we if we are truly in a space where power is shared, then 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 the hope or the goal is that actually all of these other components are are then sustained. And and lastly, and these are only my points. And of course, you you will have um, your own um, you know points to add to this. But it is not a platitude. And so, to Donna's point about um, so, sort of these statements surrounding Black Lives Matter or, or anything, or we believe in education, or we believe that the underserved, et cetera, et cetera, um, putting in that work is, 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 is even more critical. So having these blanket statements are not going to be enough. Um, they never were enough, but definitely today they're not enough. Next slide, please. 
And so I, I bring you all to this, this, um, this ladder of participation, which, which has a variety of steps. Um, you know, we're going to, we have eight steps here, and I, I'll just read um, sort of the, these uh, different steps and um, moving from non-participation into a degree of citizen power. Um, and so starting with manipulation, uh, therapy, so, and, and we can certainly relate to that in some cases as it relates to arts organizations and, and the work that we do. And then moving into tokenism, informing. So letting folks know that we have this great product that you will, you will enjoy. It'll change your life. You know, um, you know classical music is, is, is going to cure your, you know, um, your, your test scores or your, your community or, or health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, placation. Um, partnership is where we move into the, 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 the um, more critical space, which is the degree of citizen, uh, degree of citizen power, where we talk about partnership, um, delegated power, and, and, and finally citizen control. And essentially, that, that would be the, the, the space where, um, where you have the opportunity, both you, your organization, everyone who um, is critical to, to, the, to the decision making process is at that table ensuring that this work is actually getting done. So power is truly shared. And so I'm going to um, ask Hector to be off mute um, in a second, just to kind of speak on where you are in this work. And, and before you, you do that, I, I wanted to also reference that I was able to, I'm not sure and, and, and um, if anyone is actually on this, this uh, panel that shared this with me, but a, a couple years ago, I came across this, this um, article um, titled Diversity is Not a white, diversity is a white word, um, written by Tanya um, Kanyas from, from Australia. And just to extract a, 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 um, a quote from this, um, she says, just because we exist in a space doesn't mean we've had the autonomy and the process by which the existence has occurred. And so, again, this, this, this lens of, 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 um, of, of really sharing our power is critical, but, but quite often in most cases, we're sort of at the bottom end of this. We're, we're, where um, you know we're in a, the space of manipulation or therapy, et cetera. And so, Hector, where do you think you fall in this work, and how does that inform the work that you do? What a question! Woo. Um, Gary, I'm getting a little feedback from your end. Um, thank you. So there's a lot that you've named that um, that I want to speak to, um, and I think. Before I begin, it's important um, reading the chat box and, and seeing the responses where people are at, right? Um, one of the things that I want to mention is that we, you know, part of what we're also uh, inviting folks and, and proposing as the way forward, right, is that to do this work, to do work of community engagement, to do work of um, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, it, 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 it requires conversations on race and racism, deep conversations on race and racism. We're not going to do that in this presentation. We're not doing this in that, in that community gathering, but what complicates that, right, because we don't have the, that's a whole nother uh, workshop. Um, what complicates that is that uh, issues of race and racism are at the root of, of, of this conversation. Um, and so there, there are questions around whiteness that are coming up in the chat. There are questions around um, who has access and who not, and, and in responses to, to um, the, the way Donna and Gary are framing um, their, their ideas as, as black people, right, that are, are uh, presenting uh, questions and curiosities in the chat that I, that I think is important to name um, because, um, because we're, not gonna, we're not gonna be able to address that um, and we're not gonna be able to hold um, those feelings that come up around um, race and racism, those feelings that come up around whiteness um, um, in, 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 and, and address those to, to the full extent that is necessary to really understand and delve deep into, into what we're talking about. Um, and so I, named, I identified myself earlier and I think that's what brings us to, to this ladder of participation because my experience as a young person in New York City, growing up in New York City my entire life, my experience growing up in public schools my entire life, graduating from a public school um, and, and pursuing a, a college education in a predominantly white institution um, and then returning to work in a nonprofit arts organization that I was a student at um, really informed this ladder of participation. Um, it informs um, uh, where at an institute, on an institutional level, um, as an arts administrator, I was able to, to, to identify issues of inequity 
identify uh, practices that needed to, to shift um, in order to really um, equitably, like uh, in, in a way towards uh, and practicing uh, liberation, right? Um, uh, create the spaces that uh, centered our young people, that centered our families um, and what their needs are. Um, and so to name some of those um, um, at a young age growing up in, in, in public schools, I was able to identify it, um, in, in, as, a, as an early child, like maybe what inequity felt like, maybe not name what, what it was, but, but I knew what, it, what I felt like when I was, um, when I didn't have access to certain things. I knew what it felt like when everyone in the room looked differently but me. Um, I, I knew I've subconsciously and consciously um, gave people permission to tokenize me, tokenize my story um, for fundraising, um, for that scholarship that I needed, right, et cetera. Um, so what that allowed me to do in, in this latter participation um, is um, have conversations on race and racism, bring in those consultants that we need um, to, to uh, as a performing arts institution that's um, presenting to an incredibly, incredibly diverse uh, group of people, right? Um, uh, having workshops with our parents and our young people on how to talk about race um, so that we can coexist in the performance hall so that we can learn um, how to best um, view a work of art and so that we can inform our programming as well. Um, partnerships, forming the right partnerships, right? Um, who are the people that we need to be in partnership with and who are the people that we don't need to be in partnership with that are not servicing um, the, the, the families and the young people, right? Somebody raised a question around like um, youth mentors to us, like how are youth being mentors to us, right? There's a, there's a lot in the field going uh, around youth-led evaluation, right? How are the evaluations and assessments that we're creating for our programming um, being led by our young people as well? Um, and, in, and, and in those conversations with our parents and creating those conversations for our parents, how are we also uh, creating um, parent groups, parent action communities where we're giving parents the opportunity to, to step up um, and, and to move up their leadership and really inform us too on what's best for their young people in our community. Um, how are we learning from each other, right? When we're talking about what can we do together, we can't, I don't know, how are we creating meetings where we're not only just talking about race and racism with our parents, but we're also doing that with our staff members. We're also doing that with cultural organizations. And I recognize, and I want to say this, right? that we have an incredible amount of people on this call with decades of experience in this work as well. Um, and that there are gatherings and collectives meeting every day um, you know, Gary, I know you're going to speak to the Arts and Education Roundtable, right? Um, we're already part of many networks. So how are we closing those um, gaps and bringing our networks together to, to support this work moving forward? Um, and so at the, at the program level, right, and um, as, as, as an administrator that, that can have that designs programming that invites people to, that sells tickets, right? Those are the levels in which I think I'm able to participate on this ladder, right? That, um, that, that, what, what, however, like on the larger institutional level, right? Like that hasn't always been an opportunity for me. Um, and, and it hasn't, and those practices on that level haven't always been reflective either of the larger institutional the sphere. Um, Gary? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Donna. Um, I was just going to comment on the, on the, in terms of the latter participation, I feel the partnership component is really, really important. And that's where I see the um, idea of equity, perhaps having a broader role, um, because it's, because it's there that you can engage with all kinds of different entities you know, that will help advance the work. And so there I see is where we can have more, uh, not only just equity, but certainly more diversity in terms of the voices and the opinions, the perspectives, the geographical locations, you know, because even sometimes um, we think that we're touching all the communities that we actually look at it, it's still maybe just one specific neighborhood, you know, so are we really being as diverse in our thinking, you know, just in terms of the landscape, you know, where are we going? 
you know, in terms of the voices that we have, you know, not just ethnically, racially, but also age, lifestyle. How do people experience the arts? You know, that speaks to accessibility, you know, so it's not just what we look like, it's also how do we feel uh, about the arts? So partnerships can enable us to have that bandwidth, but we may not have that internally. I mean, look, we all work at arts organizations, maybe no matter how small or how big, it's how big we are, it's still not enough. You know, we still need more. And so the partnerships can enable us to have legs uh, to touch the various places that we want to go to and that it is more authentic because it's actually representative of the very people we want to engage. And so that tends to be my playground is the partnerships. I love building those. I love um, the idea of empowering communities to uh, be the spokesperson for how they want to be engaged. What does it look like? When do we want it? You know, th th that's where I think there's a, a lot of um, opportunity. You know, when I first started my work in the, you know, in the 80s, touring the country with Dan Theodore Harlem, you know, one of the questions Arthur Mitchell asked me was, where are the Black people? Because we were going to major urban cities, but we weren't seeing them representative in the audiences. And so that's when I started construct uh, the National Audience Development Task Force for Dan Theodore Harlem, where I went to the cities in advance and built partnerships with those performing venues to see. And we would sit around the table and I would say, what will it take for you and your people, your community, your friends to come and see Dan Theodore Harlem? What would that look like? And out of that, we built our campaign, whether it was appearances in the malls, whether it was bringing them to the churches, whether it was taking them to neighborhood centers, whether whatever it took, that's what we could craft. So that authenticity and honoring legacy and where people are, as opposed to us thinking, having this prescribed notion of where you should be. You know, so this is where you are. That's great. Who says what, what I'm saying is, is, quote, right? That's where it is. And so from there, we build these initiatives and we make them long term. I'm not interested in this little short term business. It's too much work. So let's think about long term effects that we can bring to each of these, you know, elements that you have on this chart. You know, how can we make sure that we are ensuring the success of our work of the arts for the next 100 years? We plant those seeds firmly now. And yes, it's going to take time. But let's remember, we get to decide the metrics for our work. So we're not going to allow other entities within our organizations to tell us what success looks like. We decide what success looks like. So it may be one year that we're fostering these relationships and now we're starting to see traction. Okay, great. Maybe it'll take two years. It'll take what we decide it takes. But again, this is the leadership that we can bring to the field, a sense of authority that we know what we're doing. So based on this is where we can demand those resources to execute our work without the struggle and the pain, you know, so intensely. So as you can see, I'm ready to turn the page. No, I, I appreciate that, Donna. Thank you. And, and I, I think, um, you know, as you talk about partnership and, you know, it's certainly one of those words that could easily still be a buzzword, right? And I think to yes, your sir. point, the way you're describing partnership, it is this, the sense of mutuality. It's, it's the idea that, um, that you're, um, you are sort of co-defining uh, what, what it could look like and what it should look like. And so I appreciate even how you modeled, you know, that in this, in this, within this, this, um, with this ladder. And thank you, Hector, for sharing what you shared as well. Um, let's have the next slide. So I just wanted to also describe and, and, and frame what this looks like in terms of um, students and student engagement. So we, we're looking at a, another ladder here, um, which was modeled off of the ladder of participation. Um, this ladder was, was created by Roger Hart, um, who, who coined this the ladder of young people's participation. And so as we move up, um, starting from the bottom, we, um, we talk about young people are manipulated at this, at this period. So the, the idea of of, you know, it's sort of self-explanatory. Then the next um, rung is young people are decoration. So similar to what Hector was describing in his own experience, being a young person um, moving through the arts in, in New York City, um, young people being tokenized, um, also young people uh, being assigned and informed. Uh, the uh, fifth was be young people uh, cons uh, consulted and, and informed and uh, adult initiated shared decisions with young people, which is moving more into um, full participation, then young people lead, 
initiate action. And then the last is um, young people and adults share decision making. And so I, I, there, I, I want to also note that there's, there's a debate on whether um, seven or eight, like if it, if it should flip, like whether it should be young people led uh, exclusively or whether it's critical to have young people and adults working together. And I think it's, you know, there's certainly um, pros and cons to both. I think I would love to see a space where um, young people are actually taking action themselves. And one, one way that is happening at the Philharmonic, I will draw an example from a program that we have called the Very Young Composers, where <clears throat> we look at um, the, the, the creative ideas of the young person. And so, um, you know, any sort of, you know, sort of genre or musical background is, or little to no experience in, um, in, in, in music. And through their own ideas, their storytelling, their images, et cetera, they're able to um, create their own works of art. And of course, they, the, the one limitation is using, um, or, or opportunity, however you perceive it, is using the orchestra as sort of the landscape, you know, by which this art is created. Um, but but this, is, this is one of the programs that I, that I would just notice as being um, sort of a strong model of that at the Philharmonic. And also, I want to call out other institutions that, that have been doing this work again. So I want to shout out to the Vibe Theater Experience, um, which is, is uh, um, uh, an organization focused on um, the experiences of, of uh, young uh, black women and, and, you know, and those who identify as black women. And, and just working with them um, through our partnerships, I've been able to see um, what it looks like when um, the youth voice is unfiltered, like it, when, when they are able to have their full artistry, their full identity reflected in, in their artwork. And so I want to shout them out. All, also urban bush women and their um, uh, entering and, and exiting community model is something that I've, I was able to participate in a couple years ago and, and, and witness and, and, um, and just seeing how they enter into communities, facilitate discussions around um, the community's ideas and equipping them with tools and then leaving to ensure that the community can take care of themselves through their art is another model. And there's so many others that, that I'm sure that you can identify and call out and, and you should mention in the chat as well. Um, but, but just to, to, to um, end this particular page with children are undoubtedly the most photographed and the, the least listened to members of our society. And so a lot of the, um, the conversations that um, were even mentioned in the chat about where, does, where is the youth voice, how can they curate their own programs, et cetera, et cetera. I think, you know, this is exactly what we're talking about, you know, moving from a space where they're just sort of, it's, it's optics and moving into spaces where they actually have power and equity in, in these conversations. So next slide. So, so how, and, and I, I'm not here to claim that, that, you know, this is, you know, sort of the end all be all, I'll give some suggestions, but I, I want to use a framework that, that, um, that was introduced to me um, through a fellowship that I did, but also through a, a book called Leadership um, Without Easy Answers by uh, uh, Ron Heif, um, Heifetz. And in it, he referenced uh, this uh, framework, uh, and I'm, I'm probably going to totally butcher the name, but, the, but it's by Snowden and Kurtz called the um, uh, Cinefin Framework. Uh, and and he, he kind of moves through different different um, phases from uh, chaotic, which is the things that can you know happen uh, it, like 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 the pandemic that we're in at this at the moment, um, things that are unknowable, the things that are known. So how to bake a cake is, is quite simple to, to to an extent, although my wife might disagree with my own baking skills. Um, complicated, you know how to the things that may require more experience, but but are certainly still knowable. Um, like building a rocket ship, for example, um, or, or anything that might, you know, kind of fall into the idea of requiring more experience. The last being co complex, which is a space that is somewhat unknown, but, but a space where we can accomplish things. And, and so the idea in, in our work, and quite often we talk about, you know, you have the power and, you know, you can make change, which I believe wholeheartedly. Um, but, I, but I would also say that, you know, quite often we then go back to our own institutions. We're working into, in, within structures of, of, um, of, of oppression and, and still centered around this idea of white supremacy. And so how do we work within those spaces knowing that um, perhaps within the larger culture of your institution or within your own community or even within yourself, um, it may be hard to, to move beyond that. And I'll just pull one example into this and it actually um, is sort of an, uh, something that, that uh, Hector and I were, are working on together, which is the, um, the Lincoln Center um, audition um, training for young people who are moving into high school. And so 
we, you know, across discipline, a number of organizations in the city are preparing young people for um, their high school auditions. So to um, be able to be competitive with their colleagues who are going to LaGuardia, Frank Sinatra, um, uh, you know, et cetera, I mean, whoever is in the city. And so the, the, the question I have and that we've sort of posed ourselves is while we are still, while we're training these young people for these experiences, uh, what are we training them for? You know, we're, we're preparing them for, you know, a, a system that is still inherently um, exclusive. And how do we, you know, sort of create a space where it actually shifts that, that, own, that system itself, where, where young people perhaps might be involved in helping to, um, helping us as adults to understand what auditions should look like for, for high schools or beyond that. Is it, is it, a, is it impossible to think that a young, a young child who is an artist can sort of determine um, what, what a, 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 an equitable criteria should be for them moving into these spaces? Or, or is it still left to the adult kind of determining or dictating what that should look like? And so I'm hopeful that, that um, these could be spaces where we were actually um, able to kind of facilitate that kind of change that we want to see in this world. Um, so, so just to kind of reference something we talked about before. Um, so so this, this idea of complexity, going back to my point, is, is something that I feel will, will require a couple of things. So moving on to the next slide, please. So, so this, in my opinion, will require us to investigate, doing our homework, understanding um, what this, you know, what, where the, the variables are, you know, what the possibilities should look like, um, experimenting. So going back to the point of what we, um, what we can accomplish together, working within your community, working within your organization to begin to experiment on things that, that may work. Um, there'll be a thousand things that you'll try that um, maybe 10% maybe of them will work, but, but kind of creating these smaller um, examples that we can kind of pull from, that we can learn and kind of t to allow us to move forward. Uh, mobilize, which again goes back to my point of being more active in our work um, and, and, and bringing people together and repeat. And, and, and I say that because, you know, quite often, you know, we're in these spaces and, and um, because of a variety of reasons, we um, sort of lose hope, we lose ideas, but the, but the idea, of, especially in the arts, is, 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 um, is this idea of persistence, you know, um, and, and, moving, and moving through this in a way that, that actually, um, you know, in a way that actually may not happen in our lifetime. So this is draw from an example of, um, or actually something that I heard from Angela Davis, where she referenced us being a part of um, the, the, the dream of the abolitionists. They didn't see their work come to fruition, but, but we have the ability to benefit from, from their, their work. And so what work will we do as organizations, as, as an arts and cultural community, that, that we may not see come to fruition in our lifetime, but that the next several generations will be able to benefit from um, in the future? So I'll leave you all with that. Thank you again for allowing me to be in this space.